Well, the, 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 the man from Stratford, not unlike the mystery from Charles Dickens, and before that, the importance of being Oscar, plays, one man plays about writers that I've done before, uh, is unusual in that I don't actually play Shakespeare as such. Uh, I talk about Shakespeare, I, I evoke Shakespeare, I become Shakespeare's characters, and one hopes that eventually a sense of who Shakespeare is emerges from this, and that you have a feeling that you've kind of met him. So I'm not, strictly speaking, I'm not playing William Shakespeare. Uh, it would be, it is a, a, a very um, interesting challenge though in itself that because for example with Charles Dickens and with Oscar Wilde one knows a huge amount of the, the, the detail both of their outer lives and their inner lives. With Shakespeare we know quite a lot about the details of his outer life but the inner life is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a mystery um, except that um, the, we have a huge body of evidence called the collected works of William Shakespeare. And so uh, the interesting thing in this show because I'm not really attempting to give you, um, you know, uh, uh, extracts from the plays as such. I'm trying to take, make a journey through Shakespeare's life in which we pick up on the resonances from his plays. So as the play is a kind of big echo chamber of William Shakespeare's work, his times, and we hope eventually of his mind and his mental landscape. So, so I'm a sort of conduit for all of those things. They pass through me. I'm the sort of, uh, you know, the reed, <laughs> or the Aeolian harp on which all these, uh, these airs uh, will play. The spine of the play is the great speech from As You Like It of Jacques' The Seven Ages of Man. And that's really our journey through the play, through Shakespeare's life, through human life itself, through Shakespeare's plays. So what we're trying to look at uh, very much are the ways in which the, uh, the, these, these great human archetypes, archetypal experiences are, are inhabited by Shakespeare. So, so, so in a sense, we're asking, uh, what was it like to be an Elizabethan baby? What was it like to be an Elizabethan soldier? What was it like to be an Elizabethan lawyer? Or indeed, to suffer from Elizabethan uh, as, uh, 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 lawyers or uh, uh, babies or, or schoolboys. Uh, um, so so, so it, it, we're trying to get to, in a way, some of the essence of human life, because Shakespeare probably more comprehensively than any other writer that we know wrote about what it is to be a human being. And that's what we're aiming at all the time. Of course, we're interested in things, the conditions of Shakespeare's own theatre, the fact that it was an open air theatre, the fact that boys played the parts of women. These are very interesting things, but we, they don't kind of detain, detain us. It's not an academic account in any sense. It's, a, it's a, an attempt to evoke a world, a mind, a place, and uh, a, 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 a work which is so all-encompassing. It's uh, extraordinary when you, when you look at Shakespeare's plays. It's kind of uncanny. It's almost spooky, that, that the way in which, although he's writing so clearly about his own time, he also seems to be writing about our, our time. I mean, for example, the, the whole issue of the law and uh, the, 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 whether the law serves itself or serves us whom it's supposed to protect. That creates a big resonance uh, now. Uh, um, uh, and we're just uh, talking about a famous speech from a play that was never performed, the play of Sir Thomas More, uh, in which he deals with the issue of immigration and the, the human issues involved in deportation. What, 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 what does it do to a nation that tries to exclude foreigners and outsiders. Uh, um, but then again, in, in looking at the experience of a, a, an Elizabethan child at, at school, uh, now that's very different. They, they had a very different system of education from ours, but it's still the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail, unwillingly to school, that's, you know, I saw that coming into work today. You know, that nothing changes in that sense. Because he was so true to his own time, he's true to ours and true to all time, it seems, at all cultures, which is mysterious and uh, 
phenomenal in Shakespeare is that, that he's been translated into well, pretty well every language that is spoken across the globe. I well remember that my, my, my first experience of Shakespeare altogether was when I was five years old and uh, I was, uh, uh, my mother was a school secretary in a, in a boarding school and my education was thrown in as part of the, her salary and I was taught by the headmaster's mother and this admirable woman used to put me on her lap every Wednesday afternoon and we'd listen to a play on the radio and I, uh, one week it was Macbeth and it n never left my mind. The images that was brought up by that uh, radio production, of course I didn't understand a, a word of it, but I knew there was something about, you know, witches and heaths and battles and fights to the death and the walking dead and all of that. It was just deeply, deeply impressive. And then, then I, I was, uh, uh, my, my family, like pretty well everybody in those days, had a complete works of Shakespeare. And I used to just read it out loud, which is not a bad way to go about uh, coming to terms with William Shakespeare, because the music infects you, you know, even if you don't quite know what's being said. And then, you know, for the rest, I, I, I went to uh, um, theatres. Um, uh, in my day, uh, the old Vic Theatre in London was the sort of home of Shakespeare. And so I saw lots of very good, solid productions, which I found very, very exciting. And then came uh, the National Theatre at the Old Vic under Sir Laurence Olivier. And then one saw things like Olivier playing Othello and uh, 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 Maggie Smith playing Beatrice and Much Ado About Nothing. And these were overwhelmingly great performances. And uh, so I was completely... Um, uh, sold on Shakespeare from, well, from the age of five. I think the older you get, the more you've lived, the more extraordinary you find what Shakespeare wrote. It, it's just uh, exceptional. Uh, um, uh, as you come up to each successive age, he was there before you, you know? And that's uh, uh, quite uncanny in a way. I, I begin to understand King Lear. I never completely, I got King Lear, you know, as an idea, but now I, I understand how closely he was writing to reality. You know. What we very much hope from this play, this production, is to open up a whole series of windows on Shakespeare that you may not have opened before, even if you know Shakespeare quite well, but equally if you don't know Shakespeare at all. I'm hoping, we're all hoping, that it will draw your attention uh, in the most theatrical way we know how to what is at the heart of his work and, uh, uh, and to the extraordinary riches and nourishment that there is in Shakespeare how astonishingly, um, how, how much better, um, in a sense, one feels about life after exposure to Shakespeare, because even at its most terrifying, uh, his, his ability to communicate human experience it, it somehow makes it seem all the more remarkable to be a human being. I mean, there's a famous... Um, Zen scholar in the 1960s who wrote uh, um, the phrase um, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. He said put that way it doesn't sound so bad and I think that's a very uh, um, uh, that's a, exactly what one feels. Shakespeare enriches the human experience.